morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello kids and welcome to season four and episode number 454 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Boom. Today, recording day. You know it, kids. It's thank God I'm fly day. (laughs) <laughs> love it, love it, love it. I love Fridays here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him. Hey, Mr. Beaver. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, the Pepper Master, the Miss Fee Mysteries from Carver Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, and while I fix my quaff because I'm a little flat in the front on one side, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, sir? Well, good morning, sir. Uh, mental health-wise... Um, jury's out on that one. I had, well, I just had uh, terrible dreams last night, and I'm still trying to recover from them. Mm. Um, super vivid, uh, death, destruction, explosions. Ooh, my! Looks like yeah. a Michael Bay movie. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it did not sit well with me. It like it took me a few minutes after I woke up to realize that it wasn't real, and none of those things happened. But sometimes you just, yeah. and that was the case for me this morning. So yeah, um, just I'm still trying to come out of it. And I had a walk with Lola, so that helps. And I do have a fresh pot of coffee, thanks to uh, and my beloved. She, um, whenever she stays over. She always wakes up and makes a pot of coffee for me in the morning. Uh huh. Yeah, and you know when when she's not here, I get up and I make it. But after I've taken the dog out, or sometimes before, it all depends. But yeah, so it was it was good to wake up to coffee because it's called a sleepless night. Even though I did get seven hours sleep, none of it was restful. Mm. And there's been recent study that has proven that. You can, some people will sleep eight, 10 hours and wake up, still feel tired. And they're like, it's just a genetic uh, disposition you have. You do not rest when you're sleeping. And I think I happen to be one of those people. And of course, with the medication I'm on to help with the anxiety and depression. <coughs> Oops. Sorry about that. I had a bit of a frog in my throat. Um, the ma- medication that I'm on, sertraline, AKA Zoloft provide you with incredibly vivid dreams and interrupts your sleep pattern. So <laughs> funny thing is when you st- first start taking the medication, it makes you drowsy as all get out. It's like okay. you floated up on Benadryl, but mm-hmm. after about four weeks, your body starts to adjust to it. And after six weeks, you're fully adjusted and then you just don't ever sleep again. But, but you don't hate yourself. So, you know, <sighs> trade-offs, right? trade-offs. I'm not sure I like that. Tra- well, I guess ultimately I like that trade-off, but I really love sleep. It's not necessarily mutual, but (laughs) (laughs) sleep is one heck of a trade-off, I have to say, or feeling rested. Well, I've I've had, when when I've had extreme bouts of insomnia, my doctor has put me on trazodone, 
And I, I notice uh, Swanky Frankie says Trazodone is, uh, is works wonders. They yeah. actually had it. And Lola was on Trazodone when we first got her. <laughs> oh, my. It took a few days to wear out of her system because when we got her, she was kind of mellow and meek and timid. And, and uh, not anymore. She's grown. She's put on 10 to 12 pounds, if not more. She's a she's a much bigger girl. When we first got her, you could count the ribs in her. And oh. I've had people that I've met like, oh, my God, she's grown so much. I'm like, she has grown. He's like, yeah, she's a bigger girl, but she's super healthy. And she's actually, oddly enough, eating less right now. And I think, and I said this to Bridget yesterday, and I believe this is the case, that because of the ongoing construction in the building, because there's new owners, they are... Um, They've just demoed about every floor but the one I live on has had okay. apartments demoed and now they're doing the renos on them. So all day long, it's noise, 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 noise. And even though Lola is in her safe, happy home, I think she's the trauma from the noise of being in a shelter for four months. Right. It's different noise, but it's nonstop all day long. And I think it's beginning to affect her because she's super anxious and needs needs wants to go out, I should say more than normal and I, you know it's like i'll finish the show and i want to go lie down on the couch for 30 minutes and she just sits on top of me panting heavily so i'm like all right come on let's go so i think yesterday i figured it out so it's like i'll just have to take her out a lot more while the construction is ongoing okay yeah i, I, I can see that yeah. yeah yeah all right uh kids and cubs uh i guess a bit of disappointing news in a way um but i mean i i understand why it was done um but disappointing uh yesterday after um our show uh i went out and i played tennis and every week i play tennis with a with a bunch of older men at the tennis club uh, some of them are in their 80s even so they, you know, they don't run around the court and whatnot. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you get the ball somewhere in their general area, uh, they still have very fast and uh, very skilled hands mm -hmm. and can uh, place a shot. Um, so, you know, I don't hit as hard as I can or anything, but, you know, the ball comes slower and I have a chance to practice certain things. And But it's always a good time. And while we were playing, in the distance, I heard, a train horn okay and something that seemed to be going on for a while now i know that all of the passenger service wasn't cut yesterday um so we're sitting there and we're talking and going like that sounds like a like a freight train right because it just keeps going and going and it's like via passenger trains are not like you know 40 50 cars long no they tend to be much shorter so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, I mean, that would have to mean that the back to work or something order has been given. I said, well, that can't possibly be because the liberals have been telling us that's not going to happen for days that that's not going to happen. Well, it seems it kind of did. Um, <laughs> not back to work legislation, of course, because the house is not sitting. But uh, according to iPolitics, liberals order binding arbitration and bid to end rail shutdown. So, so uh, we've been been told for the past week and a half to two weeks that uh, no, we're going to let this play out, and there'll be no material change from the way things were when Seamus Reagan was there, and uh, a deal negotiated at the table is the best deal. Um, but on day one, binding arbitration. So it would seem. That CN's gamble of ordering a lockout mm -hmm. that would cripple the economy. This, this to me, kits and cups, and this is going to sound controversial, and it's maybe an unpopular opinion, but is literally the corporate equivalent to what the convoyers did. Yeah, yeah. They shut down both at the same time. In two days, it was going to affect ports. It's affecting the mining industry, the automotive industry, the agriculture industry, our farmers specifically, especially, uh, you know, family farmers. And the goal was to put a bear hug around the nation, right? 
Mm -hmm. Stop stuff from coming in and going out and just to bring us to our knees. Well, I don't see what the difference is here. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Right. Choke off the stuff, choke off the economy, like in a very drastic way, not leaving any valves. Because strike action and whatnot is supposed to cause inconvenience. It's not supposed to cut you off. Well, completely. You're supposed 75 to be of its ex of Canada's exports to the U.S. are mostly over rail, so a prolonged stoppage would have. But that's what I mean. I, I can problem. understand. Yeah. Why? Yes. And you certainly, I mean, in an overall political context, if you're looking getting a leg up on the conservatives with a year or something to go, and let's say we're looking what's going on at the United States, and let's say one of the things that the liberals are hoping for is that the, America, the election of the United States goes Kamala Harris and Tim Walsh's way, and all of a sudden that sort of joy and, oh my God, maybe that can happen here too thing virus, joy virus, as the conservatives will start to call it because there's the woke mind virus. The next one's going to be the joy virus, right? Because right. being joyful or being openly vulnerable or emotional because they get that, take that picture of the prime minister crying upon hearing about the news of Gordon Downey and that makes him weird. I just celebrated eight years, by the way. Yeah. Gordon Downey, Patrick Gordon Downey's passing and in Gord we still no, trust. Eight years since the... Um... The, well, the, the final concert, not, final not concert. Passing, the final concert, sorry. Yes. yes. There's a difference. Um, there is a difference, yes. Yes, because he passed away uh, uh, somewhat after. Um, and they don't want that to spread. They don't want us getting any ideas. Right? Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, the liberals are trying to avoid handing the conservatives a narrative that they're going to punch down on because people will feel this, right? So it won't be like the conservatives are screaming and crying and belly aching about stuff that nobody's feeling or seeing in this case. So I can see why they did it. I am, yes. but I am disappointed. I'm disappointed that they didn't give it at least a week or something. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. right away. Um, but according to our policy, it was a corporate strong arm tactic and it worked. Oh, yes, it worked. Uh, so the federal Which government means they just basically kneecapped the union. Yep, basically. So according to iPolitics, the federal government is ordering Biden, this was yesterday, mm -hmm. arbitration in an effort to end day old lockouts that have shut down Canada's major railways. Labor Minister Stephen McKinnon made the announcement Thursday afternoon, hours after Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, Kansas City shuttered their rail lines due to the labor dispute. It comes, oops, I scrolled a little too far. It, scrubs as the, it comes as the federal liberals faced increasing pressure from industry to restore rail service with labor disruption, halting shipments, and disrupting supply chains. McKinnon said he has ordered the Canada Industrial Relations Board to help the party settle outstanding terms by final binding arbitration. Quote, an agreement so far has proven elusive. He told reporters, there is an impasse, and I'm using my authority under the Canada Labor Code to deliver industrial peace. However, the CRB must first determine that binding arbitration is necessary for McKinnon's order to take effect. As reported by iPolitics, legal experts suggest it's far from a guarantee that the board will side with the feds. Now, if this is, this could be, if that is indeed true, a situation where the federal government knows that the CIRB is more likely than not to say, oh, no, no, wait, this is too early places the order anyway mm -hmm. so that they can get the PR. And I'm guessing that on this one, they are more worried of losing the centrist and bit of the centrist right vote than the left vote mm -hmm. on this one. Place the order. Say, well, hey, we placed the order, but the CRB said not yet. Out of our hands. Right? So... That could be there, that too. That, that, that could be a place. Sometimes these things have levels. Well, it's, it's still unclear when exactly the trains will be back up and running. Mm -hmm. And uh, without traffic controllers manning the CPKC-owned tracks, an estimated 32,000 people across major cities might just have another great excuse for not making it to work today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, so, hey, extra long weekend. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Gilles Levasseur, professor of business law at the University of Ottawa, said using Section 107 of the Labor Code requires the government to, quote, showcase real data to justify its invocation. 
Earlier this year, then-Labor Minister Seamus O'Regan ordered the CIRB to impose binding arbitration to end the West End mechanic strike, but the board refused to make a supplementary order banning strikes, allowing workers to walk off the job. Sorry, grounding hundreds of flights. Sorry, I burped there. <laughs> Even assuming the CIRB greenlights the order for binding arbitration, it's possible the decision would face legal challenges over its potential violation of the right to collective bargaining, which the Supreme Court has ruled to be constitutionally protected. Ravi Malhotra, Ma, sorry, Ravi Malhotra, a labor law professor at the University of Ottawa, said the government would have to prove that its, quote, substantial interference with those rights can be saved under Section 1 of the Charter. That section sets out that all charter protections are subject to reasonable limits, with the courts using the Oaks test to determine whether laws that infringe on constitutionally protected rights can be saved. Quote, it would be up to the board and any appellate courts on judicial review to determine whether it meets the Oaks test. So that's going to be an empirical question, Malhotra said in an interview. Essentially, the order for binding arbitration does not mark a definitive end to the labor dispute. Earlier in the day, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said his government was working on a solution that would bring a quick end to the labor dispute. Quote, we are not taking this lightly because Canadians across the country are worried, said Trudeau. Businesses are going to be impacted if a shutdown on the rail system continues for much longer, he said. And that's something that's an impact right across the country from workers to businesses to farmers to consumers. Rail workers at CN and CPKC were locked out just after midnight on Thursday morning after months of negotiations failed to produce a last-minute deal. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh had previously said he opposed any interference in the dispute from the federal government, though it remains unclear what the decision means for the party's supply and confidence agreement with the Liberals. Quote, they know we will not support any interference, not just back-to-work legislation, but any interference, Singh said in Montreal on Thursday. When it comes to Parliament, we will be voting against it. Following the government's announcement, the NDP issued a statement blasting the Liberals for interfering in the dispute. Quote, the Liberals' actions are cowardly, anti-worker, and proof that they will always cave to corporate greed, and Canadians will always pay for it, read the statement. There will be no end to the lockouts now. And um, put a pin in that one, because we're going to get back to Jagmeet's statement there on that. Every employer knows they can get exactly what they want from Justin Trudeau by refusing to negotiate with their workers in good faith. That's something that we have been mentioning on this show, which is a tactic, right? Mm -hmm. It's like delay the negotiations, don't come to a solution, wait for something that, to get close, then go to the press and say, oh my God, people are going to suffer, businesses are going to suffer, government do something. Don't let us suffer even one second for having negotiated in bad faith. And then the government usually swoops in and says, yes, businesses, we will save you. And then the businesses then proceed to trash the government afterwards. <laughs> Not giving them any credit. So I don't know why the governments do this because they certainly never gather, gather any favor. Uh, on Thursday morning, a statement from the Teamsters Union representing the workers said the two sides remain far apart as neither company has relented on the union's demand regarding scheduling and crew fatigue. That might be the other reason that Stephen McKinnon ordered this because he didn't meet with both sides in Montreal and in Calgary beforehand. And if he got a sense during those meetings that, yeah, they're like nowhere in the same ballpark. And uh, <laughs> that whole first week is going to be like spent trying to get them in the same room. I guess I'm willing to let this go on for a week or a week and a half, but something's got to be happening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like anything. Anybody has any will to actually sit down, and make anything happen. So right away to binding arbitration, that might be a bit going on behind the scenes too, which explains this because it's a pretty quick 180 flip. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, just the day before he was quoted as saying he was going to let this play out and then it's sort of like, whoops, nope. So something must have happened in those meetings. He must've gotten a sense. Yeah, that might be the only other logical explanation, because the party doesn't have under this particular government doesn't have a history of doing this. Right. Uh, several businesses and industry groups had called on the federal government to order binding arbitration or enact back to work legislation as a means of bringing the dispute to an end. You have certain people. Uh, I think it is. Oh darn! I think it was in, in Alberta, uh, uh, Minister Dushin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, so, oh, well, of course, because nothing's ever good enough. Government should have acted on this way before. It's like, what, like before the lockouts even started? Yeah. Like, I understand that there were shipments that were being stopped and interfered with before because they didn't want explosives and perishables like food and medicine and whatnot to be caught on trains. But 
really? Like before the actual deadline? Like how much sooner? Like the, 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 they did it on day one. Dude. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <laughs> these people, man. Never happy. No. Never happy. Not. Do this. Do this. Okay, we're doing this. You didn't do it fast enough. You didn't do it the right way. You didn't do it strong enough. You didn't do it. Nobody didn't do it like we would do it. Do it this way. Okay, we did. No, not that way. That way. (sighs) Now, by yesterday when we were talking about Jagmeet Singh, we were saying like, oh, yay, Jagmeet Singh, you're telling the government, you're not going to stand for this when the government said, well, there's no way we're going to do this. Well, and they did. So I guess... I have to retract a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Um, however, um, that line I said to put a pin in, mm-hmm. um, Evan Scrimshaw picked up on that line. And, um, well, we all know that Mr. Scrimshaw doesn't have much love for Mr. Singh. Well, so, that's putting it bluntly. <laughs> yes. But I read this from him, and um, uh, every damn word all right Mm -hmm. that's what i'm saying before i read this to you every damn word quote justin trudeau's actions are cowardly anti-worker and proof that he will always cave to corporate greed jagmeet singh is the leader of a political party that was founded in part by our country's unions and built for the purposes of protecting workers the new democratic party was literally founded as a joint venture of the ccf and the canadian labor congress that it is a workers' party above else is something it sometimes has an odd relationship to, but it is the core tenet of the party. It is the one thing you can hang your hat on about the NDP. Jagmeet Singh leads a workers' party. Justin Trudeau allegedly is an anti-worker coward for forcing binding arbitration to stop the rail lockouts. And yet, Jagmeet Singh is the only reason Justin Trudeau retains the confidence of the House. Make it make sense. I know I promised to stop bashing my head into the wall about this fact, but the NDP are being led by a man so completely and utterly vacuous that he either doesn't get that a workers' party propping up an anti-worker PM is bad, or he's willing to lie about fundamental things for votes. He is either systematically lying to the country about Justin Trudeau for likes, or he genuinely believes it believe it is his moral imperative to prop up a government that, in his depiction, barely to the left of the Tories. If Jugmeet genuinely believes that, he should force an election. If he doesn't, he should shut the fuck up. But this farce is poisoning us all. Mm. Would an anti-worker party have passed legislation banning replacement workers? Would an anti-worker party have let the federal public servants strike for as long as they did without back-to-work legislation? Would the issues in the Port of Vancouver have dragged on for so long with a draconian pro-corporate government? No, obviously not. If the government was genuinely anti-worker, they have a wide commons majority for a lot of anti-union things. Look at 2012 provincially. The NDP supported the liberal minority government on most issues, but on teacher contracts, the liberals got their votes from the Tories. Mm. There's nothing stopping the liberals from shopping there, again, to pass their anti-worker agenda, except for the fact it doesn't exist. What we have is a government that has to balance broader economic interests with the specific interests of the workers in question. Binding arbitration is a reasonable compromise that gives the workers an ability to get a solution. What it's not is a sellout. But let's clear. Let's be clear. This isn't about this decision or the truth or decency of any kind. The NDP as a political party has given up on facts, truth, honor, and integrity. They are fundamentally a broken, cancerous institution led by a constitutionally dishonest man who poisons us all every time he speaks. Jagmeet Singh is, by all accounts, a reasonably intelligent man. He is not often called stupid, though he often plays stupid for clicks. Either he is genuinely so stupid as to believe simultaneously that Justin Trudeau is the caricature that Singh paints of him, a useless, out-of-touch conservative who cares more about protecting corporate interests at all costs, and that he must stay in office as an indispensable fact, or he's lying. The position he claims to hold rhetorically and the position his party has held in the House can only be held by a genuine idiot or someone who thinks we're all idiots. Every time Singh goes on one of these pseudo-intellectual flights of fancy, the overwhelming consensus response is outrage. But it's not outrage at Justin Trudeau's bad policies, but it's a universal anger that the NDP are led by someone so genuinely terrible as Jameet. 
This is a fact that unified conservative strategists who have skin in the game, run-of-the-mill liberals who are grateful every day the NDP is run by this joke, and even amongst many new Democratic voters and members think his time is up. And this is very obviously why. Where's the NDP's plan to actually fight rising prices? What's the NDP's plan to fight rising inflation? How are the NDP advocating for progressive ideas? Even if we accept a populist approach should be their path, where's the proposed rise in the top tax rate or an additional band on the top 1%? It wouldn't raise a ton of money, but at a time when inflation was elevated, reducing spending by crunching the top might not have been a terrible idea, and would certainly pull well. Where are the ideas? Whatever you think of dental and pharma, neither are exactly new ideas. Where's the national fund open to the provinces who agree to free public transit or free tuition, both ideas that Abacus just showed poll very well? What's the NDP's answer to the housing crisis beyond platitudes about luxury condos being bad? Their BC wing has done good work, and the Ontario NDP have at least made steps at good, but the federal party is nowhere. What's the NDP's answer to the rise in temporary foreign workers? Bloomberg reported that nearly 45,000 temporary foreign workers were brought into work in retail stores and restaurants in 2023. As youth unemployment rises, rents rises, and wages at the bottom end of the wage scale fail to match the impressive gains of our American cousins, where's Singh's impassioned plan? The closest we've gotten was Singh talking about the controversy around an EV plant bringing in some South Korean temporary four workers to help build the plant to make sure it works like the ones in South Korea. On the broader question of labor exploitation and wage suppression? Nowhere. Jagmeet Singh has led the NDP since 2017. His seven years in the job have seen the party lose votes and seats, and that is even true when you admit that no NDP leader was ever keeping the 15 of the, 15 of the 16 seats in Quebec that Mulcair handed off. He has failed to elect new Democrats, he has failed to defend climate action as worthwhile, and has failed to make a case for the government's signature climate effort, which is also a not insignificant redistributive effort. He has failed to stop the intellectual decay of the NDP putting up a climate change platform in 2021 that was ripped to shreds by climate experts. He has the luxury of facing a liberal government that is so very fucking clearly past its best before date, and he's still at 18%. More depressingly, he's still at 18% despite injecting venom into our politics. Jagmeet lies about Trudeau and the liberals with an ease that should terrify us all. He is so okay saying whatever he thinks will make his base happy that he has stopped caring at all whether what he's saying is true. He has been a cancer on our public life, willing to spread as much disinformation and misinformation as he condemns from Skippy. He is everything that progressives correctly hate when it's a conservative message coming from them. It's a moral stain on anyone who cannot see the vacuous and dangerous nature of his actions just because it comes in the form of, air quotes, progressive buzzwords. Jagmeet Singh is hurting this country every second he delays the inevitable. He is a cancer to our politics and our nation. For the good of this country, resign. I can't argue with that. I think he's, uh, I think we'd call that a bullseye. I can't argue with a single word he wrote. I can't. can't. Because he's right. <laughs> it's just that simple. He's right. I don't always 100% agree with, with uh, Evan, but I don't always 100% agree with anybody realistically i mean you're always gonna we have we don't see eye to eye on 100 percent of everything no. it would be ridiculous we'd be automatons if that were the case but in this case i 100 percent agree and see eye to eye with evan on that column because yep. he's could not be more correct <laughs> he could not be more accurate i and, and as mr jim said he because of uh what the party is doing and what Singh is doing. He says, I no longer identify uh, as, as NDP. I had put that on the screen earlier. There we go. Here it is. And between Singh doing what he's doing and Charlie Angus stepping away, I no longer identify as NDP. I've heard that from a few people lately. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and people who are friends of mine who are progressive conservative and identify as such, uh, when when Jugmeet was first elected leader, they were like, I like this guy. I think this guy can take the party in the right direction. I think he can, you know. And I said, yeah, I agree. A lot of us had a lot of hope. We had so much hope. He was doing and saying the right things. And then... He took the easy route. It's when he starts to... When he, pull, when he parrots 
the cons, when he parrots Pierre Polyev, that's what I'm like, dude, you're, you're disappointing us and you're harming the country. And he'll, he'll blame Trudeau for municipal affairs or blame Trudeau for, for provincial affairs. And I'm like, dude, stop doing this. You know better. Stop this. Stop parroting Pierre Polyev. Stop. You are harming the country. You are harming democracy. And you are doing it knowingly. Because you're not an idiot. You're a smart man. And you know how politics and civics work. You know what the responsibilities of each level of government are. So why are you lying to people like Pierre Polyev does on the daily? Stop it. We expect better from you, Mr. Singh. We expect better from you. Do better. Yeah. I just, for me, it's the laziness of it. It's really easy to say they're all the same. Listen, there's no universe in which the conservatives and the liberals are the same. Especially not this current crop of conservatives. No no. There, there, there's just no way. Now, again, as I mentioned before, is a vote for the liberals a pure play for progressivism? Of course not. No. They're liberals. They're liberals, yeah. <laughs> they're not you Democrats. They're not Greens. They're liberals. They're liberals. It's a difference, yes. yeah. They're a little bit center left. They're a little bit center right. They straddle it. Right? So, I mean, you, you vote eyes wide open if you're expecting the most progressive government that we can possibly get. It's not going to be a liberal government. That's well, just not going to happen. Exactly. They're more progressive than the other guy. Mm -hmm. And they're less progressive. Margin. And they're less progressive than the NDP. Well, and, and as I've said before in the past, I would say that the current Trudeau government is, has more in common with the Joe Clark conservatives mm -hmm. from the seventies than they do with his father's party. Yep. I'd say they've moved closer to the center. And, and this, this comment from Wade starting over at 61 Wade, um, I don't identify with any political party party. I simply vote for the person in my writing that has the best platform my, for myself and my neighbors. Party politics are bullshit. But yep. Wade, you and I are simpatico. I have always said that. However, I have said in the last few election cycles, I always vote for the best member in my riding, no matter the party stripe. But I have avoided voting for the con um, candidate in my riding because of what that party is doing and saying on the daily. And they've seldom ever had a possible platform that would help myself and my neighbors, being that I am working class. And many of my neighbors are too. I live in the poorest ward in the city. Centertown is the poor, poorest ward in the city, which is why Doug Ford didn't give a damn about us during the occupation because, again, we don't vote conservative. We don't. It's, we've elected uh, NDP and liberals and a strong showing for the Green Party in this riding. So, you know... Why would Doug Ford want to help out a riding that has nothing to do with him or his party politics? And besides, they're just a bunch of poor people who gives a shit. Mm. I mean, that's what it boils down to. So yeah, I've not been able to vote for a conservative party in a very long time. I have voted conservative in the past. I voted liberal and I voted green and I voted NDP because it was whoever was the best candidate in my riding. I don't identify with a party and I never will. But I certainly cannot vote conservative right now. I can't. Not with the leader they have, not with the crystal fascist playbook that they're running from, not with the MAGA, uh, maple MAGA playbook that they're running with. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I simply cannot do it. And I would never tell anybody who to vote for, but I would suggest you don't vote conservative. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I'm saying if you vote for a conservative party, you are voting against your own best interests. Oh, and you're also voting against women's right to, I don't know, have bodily autonomy? Mm hmm So, again, if Mr. Singh were acting like Elizabeth Warren, mm. I've got plans. Mm -hmm. I've got policies. He was putting something in there, out there, to get people to react to. 
something mm-hmm. substantive, knowing he's not going to get everything that he wants, knowing that the conservatives are going to laugh it out of the, out of whatever room they bring it into right off the get go, and knowing that the liberals, you know, might say, well, you know, maybe and they'll waffle a bit on stuff or say, well, this is good, this is not bad, but not be all in completely. Could be laying down markers, could be proposing a vision for the country. I mean, I know some some political parties don't want to lay down their policy platform too early, but in the case of the NDP, when you've been at it now for X number of years and you're still rolling at 18, mm-hmm. is maybe you want to set the agenda. Well, they'll steal our ideas. Good. Isn't that what you ultimately want? I mean, I know everybody wants power. It's politics. That's the game. You want power. But ultimately, don't you want other people, your ideas to be so convincing that other parties decide to steal them? Because if Mm -hmm. it's about the ideas, does it really matter who implements them? I don't know. Does it? No. If it's really about the ideas, does it matter who implements them? No, it doesn't. If it's really about the people, does it matter if somebody stole your idea? Or you say, hey, you're stealing my idea. Great, let me help. Let me help. There there was a time, there was a time, uh, and maybe I'm looking back through rose-colored glasses and a nostalgic eye, but I do remember when when Joe Clark was was prime minister for a very short time period. They they got a non-confidence vote and the government fell and and the Trudeau liberals came back in and, and ran the country for a few more years. But I do remember at that time that the conservatives supported policies that the liberals had put forth. Mm Mm-hmm. Because they said these are good policies. Right. They would be bipartisan, not partisan. Right. Bipartisan meant they worked together, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term. They worked together for the good of the country because they knew the country needed good things to happen. You remember the the national energy policy that kind of dropped, fell the Trudeau government, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Trudeau father. The father. Yeah. Yeah. Pierre Trudeau. And the the policy or, or chance of let the bastards freeze in the east. You remember that? I remember it. I remember it well. Let those eastern bastards freeze in the dark. Yes. What I also remember too is that not so recently, or not so, not so I should say, much more recently, and not too far in the past, a lot of people in Alberta who are talking about Wexit, which is not a thing, have also made mention of. We should have a national energy program. Yeah. Like, yeah, we, we tried that before and, and, and you rejected it. All and, lost your goddamn minds. And now you're asking for it again. <laughs> Would somebody please make it make sense to me? Make it make sense. <sighs> oh, God. And for those of you who are questioning why, why can't Wexit be a thing, this is why. Yep. Numbered treaties. All of that land is indigenous land. All of it. Those of you looking at the map, those of you who are listening, I'm showing the map of Canada with all the numbered treaties, which is all of Northern Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, the Northwest Territories, a portion of Yukon, and a third of British Columbia. Those are the numbered territories. There are, are, are numbered treaties, I should say. There are also uh, traditional treaties that are in other parts of the country that are not numbered. If Alberta were to attempt to leave, if they attempted to, they would have to get approval from all of the provinces, the federal government, and the crown to have a referendum. Oh, and all of the treaty lands that they lie upon. And as I've said before, Mm -hmm. the crown is not ever going to allow that to happen because like the crown or not, like King Charles or not, he is fully aware of what was done to the indigenous people of this world, of this nation, around the world for that matter, because he's fully aware of what his family did, what Mm -hmm. his country did. And he's like, I hope you don't hate us too much. We want to make it up to you. So I can tell you right now, for anybody listening or watching this anywhere in this country, if you think Wexit is ever going to happen, I have some oceanfront property in northern Saskatchewan to sell you for a great price. Ooh, I love oceanfront property in northern Saskatchewan. Right? Genuine Saskatchewan seal skin. Ooh, love 
lovely. It's so luxurious. Swanky. <laughs> so, so can we pivot for a minute or two? I got, I got, a, I got pivot a for a minute. That rhymed. Pivot for a minute. Creme set in. I'm, you know, if if you read the description about Ann Coulter and what's going on oh, there, I, you know what? Okay, before you go there, I'm just gonna say, when I saw her name pop up, yeah, the only thing I think, oh, is that dehydrated old prune still alive? Yeah, apparently. Apparently, okay. So, first off, let me show you why she's come under fire. And we are so sorry for this, kids. So, uh, there's, I got to show you a couple of things. So, first off, there's a picture of uh, Tim Waltz's 17 year old son mm -hmm. who has autism, and he yes. breaks down in tears at his father's speech at the DNC. After because his father, these are tears says, of joy and pride and love for his father. Immediately after his father in the speech is talking about that he loves his kids. Yeah. So Ann okay. Coulter tweets this. Talk about weird. Tim Walt's 17-year-old son breaks down in tears. Where did we see this before? Somebody calling someone weird because they were in tears? Yeah. Did we not just talk about the prime minister? Shell Rebel Garner? Yeah. 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 But I love the response Same from playbook. Bradley, Bradley P. Moss. I'm sure yeah. someone having human emotions would be weird for you. Yeah. Then this one here is, I think, my best, my favorite thus far, because this, this next one I'm going to show you, and Coulter's talk about weird, oh, and then what? Tim Walsh <laughs> fires back. Talk about why your fiancés keep leaving you. Coulter has been engaged several times, but she has never married and has no children. J.D. Vance would not approve of you, Anne. Now, yes. I saw that, and I said, oh, shit, that cannot be real. I went on his timeline, and I looked for it. I did not find it. Yeah, it's probably false. It's probably false. <laughs> so, because... It's probably I'm, false. Like, like, inside, I'm going, oh, damn, yeah. snap, go to him. And then I'm thinking, yeah, but politically, that's probably something you should Shouldn't really do not do, and I would be very surprised. I said, like, that I, yeah. can't be real, <laughs> get it? But it's like, good. I would like it to be real. But like, it's The good. petty part of me would, re exactly. Yeah. But I was like, no, that, 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 that's really below the belt. Then there's this video that you have to see if you've not seen. I will forewarn you with the fact that there is some vulgar language. Yes. For those of you who are sensitive delicate flowers some of us are and and yes. as you all know i've been trying to curb myself of that lately yes because i think you can express yourself without four letter words sometimes they are required and needed and and well placed surgically can be effective and boy is this effective watch oh uh, yeah she has this. me certainly she has me questioning my sexuality <laughs> At, <laughs> That's at all I will say. squared. Watch this. All I'm reporting on the very last day of the Democratic National Convention here in Chicago, Illinois, and I feel like the entire week I've been very demure, very mindful, very cutesy. But ever since I saw Ann Coulter say this about Tim Walls' the son who is disabled, I'm gonna say fuck that shit. It's all out of the window, man. Fuck you, Ann. Don't nobody give a fuck about a woman who died ten years ago and is decomposing and still dyes her hair with peroxide in the motherfucking sink. What the fuck do you know about raising children? Okay, childless monkey women for Trump. That's exactly what you are because you look like the wicked witch of the motherfucking West. They need to throw water on your ass to make you melt. We are tired of this shit. And as Michelle Obama said earlier this week, we're no longer going high when y'all go low. We're going to drag your bitch ass to hell where your unseasoned succubus ass belongs. Fuck you. <laughs> Bring the hate. Bring the hate, sister. Bring that to the pulpit and say it in church. I'm like, oh. damn. So that was damn. an insta follow. <laughs> like an insta follow. You go. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find her. I, I followed her. I'm just trying to find her Twitter to share it with anybody who wants to. Uh, we need to grow her following because damn. Damn. Yeah. She's awesome. It's, she is awesome. And the one that I saw was uh, Dinesh D'Souza. Oh, what a withered piece of. Oh, human of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Absolutely. Uh, so if you'll. Um, Put this up here. It's, so, what to, what does he say, Mr. Grizzly? This kid might have mental problems, but he's acting just like Tim Walsh. So what? What's Walsh's excuse? Tell me nobody's ever been so proud of you that they've become overwhelmed with emotion without telling me, Dinesh. 
Y'all are just the biggest bunch of joyless, dour, sad, negative, angry, and weird fuckmuckers. These well, people need to upgrade their empathy chips. Here is what took place. I'm going to have to mute that because we're going to get a yes. copyright violation for the music. <laughs> I'll probably have to ex ex excise this segment. Thank you. Thank you. His daughter's crying too. His wife is crying. His, father, yeah. his son, his daughter. Sorry. So, yeah. We'll definitely get a copyright violation. <laughs> so, apparently, being proud of your father or he's, your husband. weird. <laughs> I guess when he steps up to accept the nomination for the second highest office in the land of your nation and uses a moment there to say how proud he is of his children. That apparently is weird. Okay. Maybe you all don't have normal human relations. But on the side of the tracks that Team Normal lives on, mm -hmm. we do. This is, this, this is just normal emotion. Well, here from it's Brian, a big deal. Brian Krazerstein. Uh, the people attacking or making fun of 17-year-old Gus Waltz just don't understand what joy and love are all about. They wish they had someone who cared as much about them as Gus does his dad. Gus has a non-verbal learning disability. He is neurodivergent and has ADHD. He is proud of his father. Now shut up already. I'm glad to see people on both sides of the aisle pushing back on the filth that's out there. Treat people as if they are your own kids. Right? Right? How hard is that? How hard is that? And uh, how many times do we say uh, we leave the kids out of this? Yeah. Yeah. Leave the kids out of this on both sides of the aisle. We, we, don't, we don't do that. Leave just, the kids. Uh, hey, teacher, leave those kids alone. Right? Seriously, man. What is wrong with these people? They're weird. How could you be so devoid of empathy that you can't even understand how a child could be proud of their father? I'm just... Ah, uh, man. Now, uh, the last few days of um, the convention have taken place, and now it's done. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris has accepted the nomination, gave a great speech. Tim Walsh accepted his nomination the night before, gave a great speech. Um, you know, we had uh, John, Lennon, John Legend and Sheila E. on one night playing some music. We had Pink last night. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful event, but there's, um, one person that, uh, Mr. Grizzly, I'm going to send you a clip because we need to play this Okay. because, um, we saw her at the inauguration and she was wearing a beautiful yellow coat. Yes. She was the youngest uh, inauguration uh, poet, inaugural poet ever. Her name is Amanda Gorman. And she delivered a speech, well, a poem, on that day um, that caught a lot of people um, right here in the solar plexus and left a lump in our throats. Now, I love myself some Amanda Gordon. Gorman. And uh, 
she was invited to speak last night. Deliver another speech. Clip. I have no audio. Oh, really? Yeah, it's oh. something wrong with the clip. Okay, I'll try to find it somewhere else. Darn. Yeah, it's like it's there's no you. audio. I'm trying to load it up here, and it's just... Okay. Okay, no, it's uh, working now. Oh, it's working it's now? Working. Yeah, um, it's, the audio keeps cutting out. There's something wrong with it. Okay, maybe I can find it's it. It's not uh, my computer either, so I don't know okay. what it is. Um, then um, I will let you take over with the subject, and I'll look for it, because uh, I'm always trying to take the associated press feed. Right. Um, for that type of stuff. Yes, uh, But yesterday it was cutting a bit, so I, I will look for the NBC feed uh, for it. Uh, so if you can uh, take a, take over here for Mr. Grizzly for a second, sure I will find it. I, I have a story that um, somebody highlighted. Coffee Fixes Everything sent this to me. Uh, tagged uh, myself, you, uh, Dean, a few people. And I'm going to put this on the screen and then read it to you. Because the reason I'm putting this on the screen is because it shows a picture of the individual in question. A Cape Breton woman denied tubal ligation by gynecologist Dr. Moodley. She said, he said she needs husband's permission to get it done, and no doctor in Canada would perform it on someone without permission. Former patient testifies doctor told her future husband would regret it if she got tubal ligation or tubes tied. Uh, so? <laughs> Cape Breton doctor Manavazan Moodley facing professional misconduct hearing. A woman who sought a surgical procedure to prevent pregnancy testified Wednesday that a Cape Breton gynecologist told her the choice, she, the choice should be up to her future husband and that no other doctor in Canada would perform it on her. The former patient, whose identity is protected by a publication ban, said she was seeking to get her tubes tied, in quotes, in 2017, and was given a consultation by Dr. Manavasan Moodley, who is currently facing a multi-day professional misconduct hearing in Bedford, Scotia. <laughs> the woman was in her early 20s when she met with Moodley in his Sydney office and is one of three former patients who have testified before a five-member panel at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Nova Scotia hearing. She said... Uh, Sorry, I got a runny nose right now. She said Moodley asked her during her appointment if she had a partner, which she did, and testifies he told her the boyfriend or future husband would regret her decision to get a tubal ligation, which would sterilize her. Moodley told her that doctors would only consider doing a tubal ligation on a woman 10 years older who were on social assistance and had multiple children, she testified. It felt dismissive, she said. It felt like I didn't have the right to make that decision. I felt like I had no say in what was happening, no matter how much I advocated for it. Moodley is accused of professional misconduct and incompetence related to three complaints. The first testified earlier in the hearing that he performed a surgical procedure against her wishes during childbirth. A second woman, who was also pregnant, alleged Moodley dismissed her labor pains as back spasms and ignored her requests for epidural pain medication and testified mm. staff at Cape Breton Regional Hospital failed to pay close enough attention, which may have led to health complications for her son. The panel is hearing evidence about the complaints and is tasked with examining whether Moodley engaged in professional misconduct. Moodley is expected to testify in his own defense at a later date. Moodley has previously been dis disciplined. In 2021, his license was suspended for five months, and he was ordered to pay $325,000 after two female patients said he made inappropriate sexual remarks to them. Oh, God. He ticks all the boxes, doesn't he? Yes. Wednesday's witnesses test, witness testified she was referred to Moodley by her family doctor after inquiring about permanent sterilization. She said she told him she didn't want to have, a bio, didn't want to have biological children and her partner supported her choice, but that Moodley refused to do the procedure and did not send her for a second opinion. Moodley began the appointment by telling her he would do an ultrasound. She testified nothing inappropriate happened during the procedure, but that she didn't know why he was performing it, given she was at the office to consult about a tubal ligation. It was only at the end of the appointment following the discussion about tubal ligation that Moodley raised his voice and told her he detected a solid mass on her ovaries. She testified a later ultrasound found her ovaries were normal. Moodley's lawyer, Uniza Sheikh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, suggested during cross-examination that the complainant, the complaint was being dishonest about Moodley, referring to women on welfare with multiple children, and that she falsified notes she wrote in her phone about the incident during the following months. The woman denied that was the case. 
The woman only lodged a complaint with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Nova Scotia more than three years after her appointment with Moodley. She told the panel she didn't realize until then that she could file a complaint and also read a news story in 2020 about another complaint about Moodley. Excerpts from an interview Moodley gave with college investigators were read out loud Wednesday. In it, he stated doctors need to give sufficient information that young people can make decisions and then later change their minds. He suggested the woman gain something positive with the appointment and the information he provided given she didn't proceed with sterilization. The woman sh- said she still wants a tubal ligation, but testified she no longer has a family doctor and due to her experience with Moodley, doesn't have the drive or confidence to discuss the procedure with another physician. You think? Yeah, no kidding. The woman's mother also testified Wednesday, telling the panel her daughter was frustrated and angry following the appointment and told her she felt she'd been mistreated by Moodley. The hearing Again, has taken much think. longer than expected and has fallen behind schedule. It is now tentatively tentatively set to resume in November. That was from the CBC, uh, written by Richard Cuthbertson. He's a journalist with CBC Nova Scotia. He can be reached at richard.cuthbertson at cbc.ca if you wish to contact him. Credit where credit is due. Damn, send him some kudos. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I had not uh, seen that cross my my feed. Um, I'm wh- whoever brought it to our attention. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, hang on. You were DM Cassie. Unit. No, no. Hang oh, on. Tavi G. Uh, well, I had it a moment ago. Where did it go? It was from uh, Coffee Fixes Everything. Oh, Coffee Fixes Everything. Well, thank you so much. Sent it to you. Sent it to True Eager to your personal Twitter, my Twitter, Lisa B. Creek Pete and Dean. Dean's Twitter as well. So I guess we're the, this was 43 minutes ago it was sent out. So we're the first ones to, uh, to discuss this. I hope everybody else that was tagged and it also does. And hey, Creek Pete, Lisa B, if you want to come and join us, uh, Saturdays, uh, that, that would be tomorrow for Saturday's, uh, pubcast. Pubcast. Remember on the pubcast, we don't talk about politics or religion or political issues for that matter. We like to talk about things that bring us joy in our lives. So if you want to join, I'll send, a, I'll send out the invite tomorrow uh, to those folks if they'd like to join. Jeez, man. Wow. Uh, that, really? In Canada? That guy thought that that was a th- thing? That, mm-hmm. that he had to... Welcome to Gilead. They, uh, how long has this band been? A, like, he can't be new here. No, he's not. No. It's, uh, it's really disturbing. Wow. Wow. I'm just, could you, I'm not a woman and I'm sitting there and I, you know what? I know why this is affecting my sense of justice. I know mm-hmm. why, because I've been in that situation. No, not in the situation where I've been in a room and asked for a tubal ligation and says, no, you can't have that with your husband. But I remember being in a doctor's office one time saying, this is going on with me. It's been going on for a long time. Mm-hmm. This is what I know I need. And the doctor looked at me and said, no. I fired him. And then I went and got myself a doctor that would give me what I wanted. Well, not what I wanted, what I needed. I wanted it because I needed it. Thank God that doctor heard me. Because I probably wouldn't be with you today. So, um, the doctor that heard me probably saved my life. The doctor wouldn't hear me, but had been my doctor for over 10 years. So this came like right out of the blue. Mm -hmm. But it was like, nope, not going to do that for you. And then I got something like there, there are people in Africa that have like real problems. You don't have a real problem here. That thing. And it's like, excuse, but I don't freaking live in Africa. Thank you very much. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> and my problems are real for me. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So yes. Fortunately at that time, because we had a discussion yesterday on Amazel Fox show about how I was a, a bit of a pushover at one point in my life. By that point in my life, I had to learn not to be a pushover. I was like, oh yeah? <laughs> Check out my back. 
Because <laughs> that's the last you're going to see. Get a I good look at my ass as I'm walking out that door because <laughs> it's the last time you're going to get to check it out, buddy. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, when you go so, yeah, when you go to your doctor, you say, this is what I want. And then your doctor uh, decides that they are going to stand in your way. And then especially with one of these things, really your future husband is going to regret it. My future husband isn't getting the procedure, thank you very much. <laughs> Why? He ain't having his tubes tied. <laughs> it's like... Well, let's stick with health matters for a moment here. I just got two things that came across my ah. feed. Uh, COVID outbreak declared at Guelph General Hospital. Ooh. And uh, a reminder that Nova Scotia does not report outbreaks. It's not that we don't have them. We do. Dartmouth General Cardiac Unit has one right now kept silent you're being shielded from knowing until it's your family's turn to find out firsthand uh -huh. ouch uh -huh. Uh -huh. that's the thing with the healthcare system being uh decimated the way it is it's like for all of us who still have been fortunate enough to have not needed really serious intervention from the healthcare system, let's say over the last four or five years, it's still not real for us. COVID-19 hospitalizations at highest level since winter from the Montreal Gazette. Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. So it's still not real for us. We could, so we can still imagine it's not well, going on or it's not that bad really. Until mine, you go there or a friend that yes, or somebody that you love about goes there and then can't get the treatment. Then you realize how far we fall. Then it becomes real for you. My uh, a buddy of mine who was supposed to join us for our golf weekend, guys golf weekend at the cottage, uh, had to cancel because he had COVID. He was sick for two weeks. And we're like, how, you know, he's like, I couldn't even work. He says, I was conscious for like three or four hours a day. That was it. And he says, and the brain fog. And I said, man, I'm sorry, dude. He's like, don't be, it wasn't you who did it. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's, that's true. I'm still, knock on wood. Seven shots, six shots or seven shots? I'm not even sure. I need to get another one. I'm, w I'm waiting for the next, uh, mm -hmm. the next booster. Same here. Same here. I didn't, uh, uh, I was going to get one at the beginning of the, the summer and the spring as I usually do. And everybody is saying, well, there, there isn't like a different upgraded one yet. That one will be in the fall. And mm -hmm. you know, the one that you have will last all of that. So nervously, I, I mean, I could have gone anyway, but nervously I said, okay, I think, you know, Maybe I'll, uh, I mean, if that's, I've been preaching following the advice from the get-go, so I followed the advice. Uh, fortunately, my beaver sweetie caught COVID at some point <laughs> this summer, yes. uh, had a very, very, very mild case, uh, which was uh, fortunate. Um, but, you know, after having avoided it all this time, finally came down with it. Um, so um, I still don't know, understand how I didn't considering, I mean, mm. it's not, it's, I mean, I've been watching myself and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, you know, I've done plays, I've sung in a choir. It's not like I've been a hermit, right? I've been around people where there've been droplets singing and acting all that projected like mm -hmm. yeah. musicals, yeah. particularly right. Cast of like 24, 25, anybody going in and out all like, and it's like, it's not like my beaver sweetie doesn't teach at college. Yeah. Not like he doesn't mingle with a lot of different people. So, you know, and can bring lots of stuff home. So like we, you now far, we have been cautious without being panicked or overreacting. You know, I, I still put a mask on if I'm riding like a, you know, a bus between, between cities, sitting next to someone for two hours or whatnot, you know, in, a, in an enclosed bus, I will this, but. I'm not doing it riding the city bus during the summer for a couple of blocks. Because in the winter, though, I'm still swearing by masks because I just really don't like getting colds. <laughs> yeah, they're wonderful. I've had two colds in the last four years. Two. Uh, I have had, yeah, two as well. Yeah. Since I started masking in the winter. Well, this, and, and the one I got a couple of years back was... Uh, a week before I was to go on vacation <laughs> hmm. and I was supposed to go to Switzerland to visit a friend, but I had to cancel. Yep. 
I guess. Now the one I got this year though kicked my ass. <laughs> I, was, I was out for two weeks uh, with a, a cough, but fortunately no COVID. So yeah, I mean it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I can. Uh, well, we knew that this was coming again. This is around the time of year mm-hmm. that it does every year cycle. You know, like this as oh, we yes. get ready for go back to school and people are coming back from vacation and that type of stuff. So uh, and uh, was this in Montreal? You were saying. Montreal goes in. Yeah, yeah but Quebec goes back to school one week early. They're already back. So, um, actually, uh, that's kind of cool that you mentioned the, that that led us to this because it actually transitions to a story that I have here. Um, last year, that, I'm getting a coffee. I'll be right back. All right. Last year, when uh, school started uh, in Quebec, um, the province was short about five thousand five hundred uh, various teaching staff and all of that, and they were trying to uh, shore that up. Uh, this year, they have a similar situation, but fortunately, it is not as dire as it was last year. Um, there is a major teacher shortage still in Quebec, which is posing a serious challenge on thousands of vacant, because there's uh, thousands of uh, vacant jobs, and some 20,000 new students uh, are enrolled. Um, but, And this is more than usual because uh, Quebec... Um, is getting the overwhelming majority of asylum seekers. You often hear uh, that if you're following the national news, that one of Quebec's main complaints and demands of the federal government is to give it extra money because it is handling asylum seekers, and a lot of them, uh, and uh, saying like this should not be strictly a provincial responsibility. You know, the asylum policy is federal. If we're taking in a whole lot more because of this policy, you should give us a little more compensation to help us take care for them because it's kind of cruel to tell asylum seekers, come here, and then you've got no place for them to live and no place to feed them. Right. So uh, it seems that uh, on the South Shore of Montreal, there's a last-minute hiring Brits. Blitz at school board scramble to make sure there are enough teachers and support staff when students return next week. Oh, maybe they're not uh, back yet. Maybe they're back uh, starting Monday, sorry, uh, of next week. Uh, Joanne Hua says that she'll be able to sleep better knowing that her students have qualified educators pointing to a successful job fair. Quebec's education minister, Bernard Dreville, uh, coordinated. Um, he says that they've hired 1,900 teachers in the past week in spite of the fact that the finish line he says, in spite of the fact that the finish line is moving away from us, we're still catching up and still moving closer to our objective, which is to have one teacher per classroom for the new school year. Now, there are 20,000 more students enrolled this year than last, and mostly most of them are newcomers to the province because Quebec is currently home to half of asylum seekers in Canada. This is from the CBC, which is putting strain on a system that is already stretched. While teachers are still entering the professions, fewer and fewer are staying. So, so Basically, um, they're saying that um, the stress and the uncertainty of assignments has uh, taken some tolls on teacher. One of them says that uh, uh, Natalie Belton, who just resigned from the public system, says that she's been to six schools in the last 10 years. So the impact it had on me was that every year, it's like moving into a new house and having a new boss and learning a new situation, new families, new students. Um, So it's a retention and a recruitment issue for Quebec, which is not new to the province because the Canadian Teachers Federation says the shortage isn't necessarily because of salary. The Canadian Teachers Federation President Heidi Yetman says, quote, I would even argue that we don't have a teacher shortage, sort of per se, but that we actually have a shortage of good working conditions. We have a shortage of support in the classrooms and we have a shortage of respect in Quebec. Um, And also, Quebec still feels that it has the luxury of foregoing female teachers or male teachers that happen to have religious wear. So if you're a woman in a hijab, uh, you can't teach if you want to keep out wearing your hijab in class or if you're a gentleman who wears a kippah or a turban. So, but apparently, uh, even with the teacher shortage, they still feel they have the luxury of foregoing those teachers, uh, which doesn't make sense to me whatsoever. Um, now, it seems also with regard to summer school, which has just passed, that uh, there's a rec- there was a record number of children that went to summer school uh, because a lot of them are behind. And again, 
not necessarily right. having enough teachers and the quality of education. They're not catching up as fast as they can post COVID. So, but record numbers of kids in summer school as well. Um, the education minister says that the number of unqualified teachers in the classroom won't be known until October in Quebec. So we're, when they say unqualified teachers, they're talking about like, okay, like we really need somebody to teach French and we don't have enough. How well do you speak French and would you come and teach? So people don't, don't have a teacher's college degree or anything. But at this, certain school boards are desperate enough that they are taking people that don't have a pedagogical background. So now last, like I said, last year, the, uh, is last year there were way more positions to have to be filled uh, around this time of the year than there are this year. So they have made progress year over year, but there's still a bit of a shortage. Mm. All right, uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, do we have Amanda ready for us? Uh, we do. We right. do indeed. Let's have a look um, at this. Let's just sit back and enjoy this because I, I, everything that comes out of that, this young woman's pen, I am here for. Mm. All right. <clears throat> just a second and I'll cue it up. Activist and youngest presidential inaugural poet in American history, Amanda Gorman. Sorry, I'm just having a Stevie Wonder moment here. Isn't she lovely? We gather at this hollowed place because we believe in the American dream. We face a race that tests if this country we cherish shall perish from the earth and if our earth shall perish from this country. It falls to us to ensure that we do not fall for a people that cannot stand together, cannot stand at all. We are one family, regardless of religion, class, or color. For what defines a patriot is not just our love of liberty, but our love for one another. This is loud in our country's call because while we all love freedom, it is love that frees us all. <laughs> Empathy emancipates, making us greater than hate or vanity. That is the American promise, powerful and pure. Divided, we cannot endure, but united, we can endeavor to humanize our democracy and endear democracy to humanity. And make no mistake, cohering is the hardest task history ever wrote. But tomorrow is not written by our odds of hardship, but by the audacity of our hope, by the vitality of our vote. <laughs> Only now, approaching this rare air, are we aware that perhaps the American dream is no dream at all, but instead a dare to dream together. Like a million roots tethered, branching up humbly, making one tree. This is our country from many, one from battles, one our freedoms sung. Our kingdom come has just begun. We, 
redeem this sacred scene, ready for our journey from it. Together, we must birth this early republic and achieve an unearthly summit. Let us not just believe in the American dream. Let us be worthy of it. Thank you. Yeah. Now, she's talking about the United States, but uh, there's not a word of that that doesn't necessarily apply here. Yeah. It applies. I love everything that comes out of her pen. Oh, yeah. And again, so young and nearly regal in her poise, in her delivery. Yeah, she's, I, I she's, just she's constantly good. Constantly impressed. I'm constantly impressed. That if I had that poise at that age, I would have been dangerous. I came out like when she did the first speech, like keep your eyes on her. She's going places. She was going places way before I said that. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but I just and you could hear a pin drop. She had everyone's attention. Everyone's attention. Amanda, you go. You go. I love her. Oh, yeah. All right. Kids and cubs, let's see. Um, I, I have something for you that you yes, might, please. might not be aware of. Um, I'm going to put this on the screen because there's a photo that is attached to the tweet, and I think it's important that it be seen. And here's the thing. If you think this can't happen here, you're very naive. As of today, this is how women must dress in Afghanistan, according to the Taliban's supreme leader. The following rules are now in effect. The full face must be covered. No hands, nothing visible. The black veil was presented as a recommendation a year ago. Now it is the law. Hmm. And the photo, accompanying photo, is a group of women that are completely covered. You cannot, it's, it's just a black veil. Complete face covering, you can't see hands or anything. If you think that can't happen here, I'm telling you it can. And you know how we can prevent it from happening here? Wow. Simple. Vote. Do democracy vote the next provincial election the next federal election vote and vote for the party who doesn't lean into that and if you think there's a party in this country that doesn't lean into that i've got again oceanfront property in northern saskatchewan to sell you mm -hmm. well that whisper was for the folks who like some asmr whisper content by the way because i haven't done that in a while <laughs> <laughs> I used the wrong mic for it, but you know, it's, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had um, heard a story the other day. I didn't uh, make note of it because I didn't think there would be any opportunity to raise it in the context of our show. But uh, yeah, that uh, in Afghanistan, they were they were mentioned that uh, the number of uh, people that have been uh, arrested over the past little while for not having followed the modesty rules and whatnot for the women, but um, it affects men. Mm -hmm. affects men because there were a whole bunch of people that were arrested men because uh they, they were, were against it well not against it they weren't growing their beards oh they weren't growing their beards yeah yeah well and, not just women so that's, that's the thing is they might come for women first but there's going to be stuff for you too oh, of that's course. why you need to get involved when well, you see your sisters being pushed down you remember when when uh stephen harper tried to ban uh the burqa and the niqab. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of pushback on that because they're like, well, hold on a second now. Uh, you're infringing upon people's right to make a choice if you take that choice away from them. So, you know, 
it, it's, it's, it's a complex issue. If you're forcing people to do what Afghanistan is doing, then we got a problem. Now, if you ban somebody from making a choice to dress in that manner, if they choose to do so, I still have a problem. People have the right to choose to dress like that if they want. And the argument from the Harper government was, and remember he called himself the Harper government, not the government, Canadian government. Mm -hmm. The argument was, well, people are forcing women to dress like this and we're going to take that away from them. To I'm like, you know what? There's probably people forcing women to do that. Yes, I, I'm sure there are men who do that. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind. But I think mandating and putting into legislation a, a ban on being able to wear an article of clothing, you're on a slippery slope right there. What's next? Nuns can't wear a habit? Oh, no, that's fine. Oh, really? Because uh, hijab is similar to a habit. You can't teach here if you wear a hijab. In the province of Quebec, you can't. Yep. But a nun can teach, right? Well, that's a Catholic school. Mm, yeah, but uh, the Catholic school is funded by the public purse. So please explain to me the double yeah. standard there. Not in Quebec anymore, fortunately, here in Ontario still, but... Oh, it's not in Quebec anymore? No, in Quebec they got rid of their de denominational school boards. Good. We yeah. shouldn't have it in Ontario either. Yeah. I don't think that the public should be paying for uh, uh, an education that is founded on religion. Y you want to have you want to have religious schools? No problem. Pay it out of your own pocket. Yeah. Yes, and 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 you're right about this uh, from Re Saucy Sea Witch. There are also Christian men who want to force women to wear dresses and not pants, and many yeah. of them are involved in politics on both sides of our international border. Yeah. This was at, um, on June 15, 2005, that uh, Quebec adopted Bill 95, which abrogated the denominational status of Quebec schools by abolishing the Catholic and Protestant committees of the Conseil Supérieur de l'Éducation. So it's been 19 years already. I didn't know that. Ontario, what are you waiting for? Yeah, no kidding. The same. Um, now, about that thing you mentioned about Afghanistan, I decided to look it up a little bit. Um, according to Yahoo News, Afghanistan's Taliban rulers have issued a ban on women's not only bare faces in public, but voices in public, <sighs> under new laws approved by the Supreme Leader in efforts to combat vice and promote virtue, because apparently it's a vice for women to speak in public. So I've um, got uh, from, from Sarah Wahidi a full list of new laws signed off by their Supreme Leader, and of course it's written in Arabic, uh, but I scroll down and she's translated it. And uh, let me just bring it over here where it's easier to read. Women must cover their face fully. The hijab garment must be thick and not tight. Women must not wear attractive clothing, tight clothes, or clothes that reveal the shape of their body. Women must not wear clothes that expo expose the body or neck. Women must not reveal their hair or wear see-through clothes. Women must not, must not wear short clothes. Women must not apply perfume or cosmetics. Muslim women must avoid in imitating the dress styles of non-Muslim women. The laws were issued Wednesday after they were approved by Supreme Leader Hibatullah Akundzada. Akundza, a government spokesperson said the Taliban had set up a ministry for the, quote, propagation of virtue and prevention of vice after seizing power in 2021. The ministry published its vice and virtue laws on Wednesday that cover aspects of life, everyday life, public transportation, music, shaving, and celebrations. They are set out in a 114-page, 35-article document seen by the Associated Press and are the first formal declaration of vice and virtue laws in Afghanistan since the takeover. Quote, Inshallah. We assure you that this Islamic law will be of great help in the promotion and virtue and the elimination of vice, said ministry spokesman Morvi Abdul Ghaffar Farouk on Thursday. The laws empower the ministry to be at the front line of regulating personal conduct, administering punishments like warnings or arrest if enforcers allege that Afghans have broken the laws. Article 13 relates to women. It says it is mandatory for a woman to veil her body at all times in public and that a face covering is essential to avoid temptation and tempting others. Clothing should not be thin, tight, or short. Women are obligated to cover themselves in front of non-Muslim males and females to avoid being corrupted. A woman's voice is deemed intimate 
and so should not be heard singing, reciting, or reading aloud in public. It is forbidden for women to look at men they are not related to by blood or marriage and vice versa. Article 17 bans the publication of images of living beings threatening an already fragile Afghan media landscape. Article 19 bans the playing of music, the transportation of solo female travelers, and the mixing of men and women who are not related to each other. The law also obliges passengers and drivers to perform prayers at designated times. According to the ministry website, the promotion of virtue includes prayer, aligning the character and behavior of Muslims with Islamic law, encouraging women to wear a hijab, and inviting people to comply with the five pillars of Islam. It also says the elimination of vice involves prohibiting people from doing things forbidden by Islamic law. Last month, a UN report said the ministry was contributing to a climate of fear and intimidation among Afghans through edicts and the methods used to enforce them. It said the ministry's role was expanding into other areas of public life, including media monitoring and eradicating drug addiction. Quote, given the multiple issues outlined in the report, the position expressed by the de facto authorities that this oversight will be increasing and expanding gives cause for significant concern for all Afghans, especially women and girls said Fiona Fraser, the head of the Human Rights Service at the UN mission in Afghanistan. The Taliban rejected the UN report. That's Afghan women went from whatever freedoms they had gained during the time that they were occupied by the United States and allies to this in three years. Now, let me show you an image. Three years. Let me show you an image. And I will describe this image for those of you who are listening to the audio-only version. The image has a, a, a line at the top of it that says, To those of you who think we are overreacting about Project 2025, these are women in Afghanistan in the 1970s. And it's women wearing short skirts, lovely blouses, three of them just walking along. Heels. Yeah. Very fashionable, super stylish. Very 70s. Now... If somebody's thinking, well, I'm okay, Paul, anybody can make that up. I go, yeah, you're right. They, anybody could make that up, except um, I'm going to show you uh, some, that, that photo was taken in 1972, by the way. And to verify that it's in Afghanistan, this is from Getty Images. There are pictures of women marching in the streets in Afghanistan, women in, in short skirts, Getty images. Now, if I want to, let me, I'll just click on this. I can purchase this image for $575 if I wish to on Getty images. So hmm. we'll probably have to excise that um, <laughs> segment mm. for fear of, of, yeah, anyway. Yeah. You know. I am a, so yeah, if somebody was saying, well, Paul, that's all fine and good, but anybody can make a meme. I'm like, yeah, you're right, except this meme is real. That is real. It's from 1972 in Afghanistan, verified by Getty Images. So it's not fake. It's real. So they went from absolute freedom like we have in the West to completely being covered if they're in public to the point where you cannot tell what that person looks like whatsoever. If you think this can't happen here, I'm telling you it can. There are people who want that. There are people who are preaching that on both sides of our international border. First, they take away your reproductive rights. They will, they will outlaw abortion like they have done in multiple states in the United States of America. Then they will take away contraceptives. What comes after that? Same-sex marriage. Then they start to outlaw things. They will do it incrementally, but it will happen quicker than you can think. It's, um, it's a scary, slippery slope we're on right now, and if you do not do democracy, if you do not exercise your right to vote, this is what happens. I'm not being alarmist, I'm being realistic. There are people on both sides of the international border, in the Canada and the U.S., who want that. It's bad. And it will not get better if we don't do something to fight it. So make sure you get out there and you do your democratic civic duty and vote. 
Vote in the election. Vote in every election. And by the way, the most important election you can vote in, the one that affects your life every single day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, is your municipal vote. You don't believe me? Let me explain to you how your municipality works. When I wake up and my hydro is operational and I have air conditioning on a hot summer day, that's due to Ottawa Hydro, which is owned by the municipality. When I get clean, fresh drinking water from my tap, that is municipality. When I have clean streets, when I have police that take care of problems, when I go to the hospital, now the hospital is, yes, provincial, but they're operated at a municipal level. So yeah, voting is important. Voting counts. Democracy mm-hmm. is something you do. Get mm-hmm. out there and do it. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, another story <clears throat> that just came out since we talked a little bit about labor issues at the beginning uh, of the show with regard to rail. Um, we also might have some uh, labor issues with regard to planes. Air Canada pilots have voted overwhelmingly to approve a strike mandate, mandate putting them in a position to walk off the job as early as September 17th, according to CTV. The Airline Pilots Association, which represents more than 5,400 aviators at the country's largest carrier, said the vote passed with 98% support on Thursday. I guess they mean it. The employees have been negotiating with Air Canada since June 2023 with ongoing talks in Toronto hotels overseen by a federal conciliator. So once again, we have a situation where talks have been going on for a year or more, and for some reason, the company just can't seem to get there. Until workers have to say that they're going to strike, even with talks overseen by a federal conciliator. Still can't manage to get there. That process is slated to wrap up this Monday, followed by a 21-day 21 day cooling off period, leaving September 17th as the soonest possible strike date. Charlene Hoody, head of the union's Air Canada contingent, said the vote sends a clear message to management that pilots are willing to take job action to secure better deal. Quote, it's a stale, outdated contract, she said in a phone interview. There are elements of our collective agreement right now that just stem back to Sorry, that stemmed back to just post-bankruptcy. The airline filed for bankruptcy protection in 2003. Hootie said the two sides have found consensus in some areas, but that wages and some aspects of scheduling remain sticking points. Following new contracts between the four biggest U.S. airlines and their pilots over the past 18 months, some flight crews earn roughly double what their counterparts at Air Canada make, she said, pointing to United Airlines in particular. Quote, we all fly passengers under the Star Alliance, so we're flying the same passengers in the same airspace on some of the very same routes, and those pilots are being compensated dramatically more than us. Ariel Melul Weschler, Air Canada's Chief Human Resources Officer, said the parties had reached agreement on many, many articles of the collective agreement. She noted the labor stability that marked the decade covered by the now expected co- expired contract. Quote, but of course, with a 10-year deal, it creates a bit of pent-up demand. So it's time to refresh that agreement, she said in a video posted to Air Canada's website Thursday. Air Canada CEO Michael Rousseau told analysts earlier this month that both sides were in agreement on several points and that he hopes to reach a deal in the coming weeks. Hmm. So there you go. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this one will be resolved um, amicably. Let's I guess so. the word or uh, cooperatively uh, prior uh, to uh, anybody having to be uh, have their plans disrupted. Hopefully, all right, um, Mr. Grizzly. Do we have a show? We do. I just have one clip for you that I want to show you, and then we'll wrap it all up. I think you'll like this. It's quite. Okay. Um, it's quite amusing. This is uh, Elizabeth Warren at the D- Democratic National Convention. It's a short clip. It's only 35 seconds. It's unfortunately low res, but there's nothing I can do about that. But uh, just, just, just watch this. 35 seconds of, oh my, she said that. Groceries, gas, housing, health care, taxes, abortion. Trust Donald Trump and J.D. fans to look out for your family? Shoot, I wouldn't let those guys, I wouldn't trust them to move my couch. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know the whole J.D. Vance couch story, which yep. was not true, but. <laughs> we need Kamala Harris. This election. 
<laughs> I thought that was I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that, that that that's that that's really great. And you know, I I had the time to watch um, Michelle Obama's speech and then uh, former President Barack Obama's speech. Um, and okay, Michelle Obama, seriously, that that woman is fire. Right. Mm-hmm. And she delivered something absolutely fantastic. And, you know, some, a, a little bit of a modulation on uh, when we go low, uh, when they go low, we go high. And she, she wasn't telling people not necessarily not to go high, but sort of making it clear that going high does not necessarily mean that you have to be polite about it or that you have to be meek about it. Right. Um, and then of course, um, nobody gets under Donald Trump's skin better than, uh, former president Barack Obama. And, uh, he threw a little nonverbal shade. A little bit. I don't know what exactly, but a little nonverbal shade during the speech. I was like, Ooh, Barry, my man. Uh, I think he made a couch comment too, actually. Made of, um, but he made a, a, a size common, uh, which had a Donald Trump responding something about, Oh, uh, I saw the little attack on me. And it's like a dude considering what the attack was, maybe that you shouldn't have used the word little in your response. <laughs> petty, petty, petty is my favorite color. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and then I saw this comment and it's like, yeah, Barack was good, but Michelle was great. And it's sort of like, well, yes, she always is. She always outshines him, and uh, he's good with that. He knows she's going to outshine him. He started the speech. It's like, yeah, I'm the poor sucker or something like that that agreed to speak after Michelle Obama. (laughs) He knows what his wife's capable of. Oh, yeah. And he's fine with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's good with it. He loves her. Mm Mm-hmm. Man, does he love her? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, they did what they needed to do. Mm-hmm. It was well choreographed. It was well staged. Uh, there was uh, a mix of the appeals. Um, you know, I'm listening to a lot of speeches, and there was a lot of talk of Donald Trump. I would have like had. I would have preferred a lot more of referring to him as you know, and the other guy or whatnot, and not by name, and sort of diminishing him a little more and uh, not describing him, describing him so much as dangerous because when you do that you give them power because that's why weird works so well it, it just makes them look hapless and weak and funny <laughs> you know uh, like this one he's dangerous but he is dangerous it is true and it does need to be said fortunately there there was a good balance between both messages there wasn't too much mm-hmm. uh the vote because we'll be making history by electing the first female list, which is, which is true and it's nice and it's inspiring, but ultimately that's not what people vote for, right? It's, it's a nice side benefit, why not? but it's ultimately what people, not what people vote for. People vote for what's going on at their kitchen table, what's going on in their doctor's office, what they don't want to be going on at their doctor's office as well. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and as a, Tim Wall says, and I really like this line, mind your own business. Mm-hmm. Mind your business. You have a problem mind with your gay, business. You have a problem with gay marriage? Don't have one. Don't have one. Don't attend one. Don't you like have abortion? Don't with, have one. You have, the way, you have a problem with the way people dress or gyrate at pride? Don't there go. Don't go. It's pretty simple. You have a problem with how other, you have a problem with kids being at Pride and seeing that, well, it's their parents who brought them there. Mind your own damn business. Maybe you should ignore. (laughs) You have a problem with a family that does want to get hormone therapy for their transgender child. It's not your child. Mind your own business. It's not your family. Mind your own business. Your opinion about how it is that I run my life and the choices I make for myself, particularly in my bedroom, in my house, 
and in my doctor's office. Not your damn business. Completely and totally irrelevant to my life. Mm-hmm. You care a whole lot about more about me than I do about your opinion. Opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. Thanks. Mind your own damn business. And then when it comes something, the, conversely, if you're minding your own damn business, when something is happening, like, for example, as I mentioned, kids in care, being in unlicensed mm-hmm. care and sleeping in hotel rooms that are filled with big bugs, mm-hmm. grandma and grandpa being at a long-term center that hasn't been inspected in two years. People being left homeless on the street, addicts being sentenced to death because they happen to have an addiction. Stop minding your own business. We tend to mind our own business when we hear, when we live in an apartment building with paper thin walls and we hear women or men or children on the other side yelling and screaming after we hear loud thuds. Oh, I don't want to pry. I don't want to get involved. Mm. But you hear about somebody across the country who says, uh, I would like to be referred to as they. And then you're all up in their grill. Funny how that works. Perhaps pay attention to the person on the other side of the wall that's getting smacked around. Stick your nose in that by picking up the phone and call 911. And leave the kid alone. Maybe. There are times when we're not supposed to mind our own business. But for everything else, keep your head down, live your best life, and don't let what other people do dominate your world. Live and let live. Or for people who are more religious, Let go and let God. Mm -hmm. If you truly believe, for those of you who believe in God, that there's one ultimate judge, stop judging in his place. Yeah. He's got it. Okay? Doesn't need your help. Or she's got it. Or they've got it. But they don't need your help. (laughs) You call them God for a reason. I think they know better than you do and i think they're better placed than you do to have seen and have known everything to make a decision with all the facts you don't have them so why bother it's just a waste of your precious time time that you could be spending devoting to your own family your own kids the people that you love and to try and make the world a better place get your nose out of other people's business Period. All right. Get some cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So, you need to tell your peeps and poops all about us. See, this is a time where we don't want you to mind your own business. You'd be all up in our business. Tell everybody about us. (laughs) <laughs> and if you'd like to make sure that you don't miss an episode, well, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because it's Thank God on Fly Day, and there's almost nobody more fly than the Ray Girl, because she sponsored our pod page. Put in her money where her mouth is, doing democracy. <laughs> so if you scan that QR code that's below my chin, that will bring you to our pod page. And if you are listening, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters, with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like to help us in other ways, then you need to make like Kit Elaine and surf on down. Surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And there we have not one, not two, but three because we're generous like that. Buttons for you to click. Like, share, subscribe. Click one, click two, click three. They like it when you do it. And when you do it, it gives us all a little bit of happy. So thank you so much. And if you would like to help us in other ways, that QR code that's by Mr. Grizzly's head right there. Well, that will bring you to our coffee page. And that's our tip jar. 
where uh, you can help and encourage us and support us if you would like to us to do more of this because this does come with a few costs and anything that you can do to help us cover them we would be most grateful for but if you cannot donate in any way please do not feel bad about it because the gift of your attention your presence your participation on our show everything that you do to help make the show better that's what really matters to us so we like to hear from you True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is our email address. At True Eager is our Twitter feed. True North Eager Beaver on our Facebook. Or leave us a comment if you happen to be watching on YouTube right in the, the comment section. We do read everything, and we thank you for everything that you tell us. Because even the stuff that's, you know, not so great, mm-hmm. even when you disagree with us, please, if you're going to come and disagree with us, come correct. Right? Show us the same respect we show you. But otherwise... Feel free to disagree. Every single comment helps. Sometimes in a disagreement, you raise a point that's valid. And we take note of it, and we make adjustments as we go. So there you go. All right? (sighs) Because democracy is something that you do. Remember, we have some by-elections coming up. Uh, The one in uh, Elmwood, Transcona, in Manitoba, and La Salle, Lemar, Verdun, in uh, Quebec are coming up pretty soon, early September. So uh, please, if you haven't gotten involved there, please do plan your vote. Make sure that you bring people with you because friends don't let friends do democracy alone. Remember, Ward 15 in Toronto, that's coming up. And then we also have some provincial elections coming up in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. And we need you to get involved because we've got to flip some of those provinces. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourselves. And the other thing is, when you take some time to be kind to and gentle with yourself, it usually translates later into you being kinder and gentler with others, even those who don't agree with you or you don't agree with. You might even be kinder and gentler in your disagreement. Mentioning that for the, a certain person that has decided to grace our chat, with their presence mm-hmm. today. And thank you, Kits, for being, for uh, communicating using our values here in the chat. We appreciate it. We appreciate that very much. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom for us today? Yeah, I do. Uh, I put a link in the chat earlier. I'll put it in again. Um, this, this, this will do nothing, what I'm about to show you. It will actually do nothing, but it might make you feel a little bit satisfied. Uh, from change.org, the man, the reg- resignation of MP Michelle Ferrari from the status of women committee. Yes. Again, this will do nothing. It, it won't change a thing. No. But it does send a message. So I will put the link in the chat. If anybody wants to click on it, you can go ahead and, and, and go in and voice your opinion if you like. Mm-hmm. It's up to you. I'm not telling you what to do here, but... Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we are deeply offended. Hang on, I'll I'll just, I'll bring this over so I can read it to you. We are deeply offended by the actions of MP Michelle Ferrari and are calling for her immediate resignation from the Standing Committee on the Status of Women. She has proven time and time again she is an unsuitable member for this important committee. MP Ferrari was a disastrous choice for the committee given her past disrespectful profanity lace rants on social media and ongoing misleading statements in the House of Commons and on her social media. Most recently, she used her position of the Status of Women Committee to play partisan games and re-victimize women who have experienced violence. She is repeatedly rude, condescending, and refuses to listen to committee testimony as she seeks advantages for her social media clips. It goes on from there, but that's all I really want to say is this will do nothing, okay? It's completely ineffective. It's not how it works, but it might make you feel better. And it helps to send a message. And let's, let's put it this way. If enough people do it, even though the conservatives probably won't change anything because, well, you know, admitting that they did something wrong is a, they'd rather make things disappear and try to pretend we didn't notice and it exactly. never happened rather than saying, oops, we screwed up. Um, but uh, if there's enough that do it, you know, even though they might not do any, it, it does register. People will go, ooh. Maybe yeah. that happens. So it sends it, a message. It, it, it won't it, change it a damn a thing. But, but it won't it change a message, message because yes, because changing something would have to be them admitting that 
something needed to be changed. Exactly. And that's not that's not their thing. Uh, speaking about her, though, um, that uh, tweet we saw the other day of her uh, claiming that there were people that uh, trafficked their own children, and then she was accused of having deleted it. And then we did a verification and she hadn't deleted. In fact, she doubled down. So we printed a retraction because we had shared it and said, hey, we don't want to share misinformation. Sorry. Well, it turns out she ultimately did delete it. So for the first time ever in Eager Beaver history, we had to print a retraction for our retraction. Uh, yeah, she did. Um, apparently, um, and, and just in very Sarah Fisher style, when she said about uh, the fever dream video, uh, mistakes happen. And uh, we pointed out uh, that that many mistakes within the course of three to four minutes with all these layers of verification and it still goes out doesn't just happen. Those are mistakes that are committed. And those are mistakes that some people originally never thought were mistakes because mm -hmm. that's the only reason that shit goes out. Well, um, she said something about, um, oh, uh, something about her words uh, having been inartful. Then please, Michelle Ferreri, if you happen to be listening or if you have some minions or hate listening to this, please pray tell. Tell us how you would say what it is that you were trying to say in a manner that would be artful. And please don't be afraid to be very specific because right now I'm seeing a situation where you were apparently very, very concerned about children being trafficked by their parents, but uh, you, yet you did not call a special extraordinary emergency meeting to deal with that. And mm -hmm. all you said is, oh, these words were uh, probably inartful and then deleted it and hope we didn't notice and that it would disappear. But uh, if those kids are being trafficked, then they're still being trafficked, aren't they, Michelle? And if this actually was a real issue for you and not some uh, um, football that you are trying to spike, football in the form of children that you are trying to spike in the end zone, then um, I fully expect that you should be uh, requesting and demanding some action and probably being at the lead of the parade, making sure that action takes place. Right, Michelle? Or was it never about the kids? It was never about the kids. She's just Mr. a terrible person. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. I need to sharpen my nail file. Oh, okay. I've I kind can... of worn it out today. I think so. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients Fill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Well, kids, cups, just a little quick Easter egg. Number one, five days from the opening ceremonies of the Paralympic Games. So uh, remember, if you have an opportunity uh, to go to a Wheelchair Basketball Canada site and uh, buy one of those t-shirts to support our Paralympians, that would be fantastic. And uh, also in sports news, for those of you who happen to be, like me, tennis fans, the fourth Grand Slam of the year is about to start. The U.S. Open. That's and right. uh, yeah. yesterday, uh, a young man from Canada named Gabriel Diallo qualified, having won three matches in a row into the main draw of the U.S. Open. This will be his second Grand Slam. Earlier in the year, he qualified for Wimbledon, did lose in the first round. Um, but, hey, watch this young man. And he, he's like about 6'6", six, six, again, like like Raonic was, or is. Um, so uh, a little leaner. Um, Raonic is a little uh, stockier. Um, but um, he is uh, someone to watch out for. He's, uh, he is going to be, uh, before very long, 
before very long, he's going to be a top 100 player. I think he's about like 156 or 140 something in the world right now. But uh, keep your keep your eyes and your ears out for him, Gabriel Diallo. You will be hearing a lot uh, about this young man very, very, very soon. All right, that's everything. Have a beaverific weekend, everyone. I'll uh, I'll see you sooner than you may expect. Yes, Tomorrow yes, yes. For the podcast, podcast. Do join us. Yay. I love podcasting. Welcome to the place where everyone knows your name, where everyone's your friend, where good times are had by all. Sit back, relax, pour yourself a beverage and enjoy our company. I know we'll certainly enjoy yours. Welcome to the True North Eager Beaver Pubcast. Once a month, we gather at the Lieutenant's Pump at 361 Elgin Street in downtown Ottawa, Canada's capital city, bringing you joy and happiness all day long.